Good morning and welcome to Urban Life Church Online. My name is Kelsey and we are so excited to be with you this morning. There is so much happening. Sooner or later, someone's going to jump behind me, but we're so expectant for this morning as we continue in our series on weightier matters. And as we walk around and find the stories of this Sunday, won't you join us? And uh, we'll see you soon. So I've just got my coffee and come to, I think it's the best area, it is the right? Best area. Which now, area is it's it? It's our guest area. It's, it's located in the center of our beautiful foyer, right? In the show them, show the people, Lucia, show the people. Look at this. There, there are waffles here in the morning. JB's over there. Hi, JB. We make burgers here in the afternoon. So it's just the best area to come and get food. But then also, if you're a guest, come into the guest area. We have people here well, well, ready to welcome you uh, into the family. Amazing. I love this area. I love coffee. I can't wait. We're going to get started shortly. I'm, I'm excited. How's the Wadia Matters been? Oh, the Wadia Matters. It's, it's just, it's a new perspective on like, what should we take seriously? and what's, what's, what's important, right? the way to your matters. Yeah. Love that. We'll see you off the back of this. Yeah. Cheers. I am here with Unam who just made a decision to accept Jesus. Well done. How are you feeling? Overwhelmed. <laughs> Overwhelmed. Overwhelmed. Yeah. What led to this decision? So um, from last year, I've been getting, getting into a lot of trouble with my parents, oh. doing things that I shouldn't be doing, which led to us fighting a lot and me feeling like I shouldn't be on the earth. So, um, yeah, and today just something told me, just accept God, you know, yes, you've done wrong, but He's calling you, He keeps sure. calling you. I kept hearing a voice telling me, Unam, go give your life. And I was Come resisting on. for a few minutes as the song was playing. And then I just kept resisting. And then something in my mind just said, go. And then I went. You went. Amazing. Well done. What an incredible decision. The best decision you've made. 16 years old. 16 years old. And what are you hoping for the future? I'm hoping, um, ooh, what am I hoping? I'm just hoping to prosper, you know, and I'm trying to live for God and not for the world because I've been battling with those two things. And yeah, just help people come to God and stuff. So, yeah. Amazing. How cool is that? We're celebrating with you and we can't, to hear, can't wait to hear more of the testimonies coming out of this morning. So stay tuned. So I'm sitting here. I've just found some friends. Is it your first time here? Have you been coming for a while? It's my first time. Really? And here we are sitting here, your first time. Welcome to Urban Life. How's the crunchy? Nice. Is it good? Yeah. And you have coffee there. So you're ready for the morning? Yeah. Awesome. Where are you guys from? Colswood, here in okay. Mitre. And how did you find Urban Life? We've been passing here almost every day. And today was the day you decided to come? Here's the reason why I'm oh, here. Oh, nice. Are you going to go to Life Kids? Awesome. We got to catch you after the meeting so we can find out how it is. Hey, so you're about to watch a moment that took place this morning. And I got the privilege of preaching and sharing some stories. But ultimately, what took place in this hall today is that God did some weighty things. And uh, my preach is all around weighty moments with God that change our lives. It's beyond our thinking. It's experiences with Him that really change us. And this morning, He did that. I told a story about a lemon tree that left me in tears. It left all of us in tears. And it reminded us that God sees us. He is for us. He is faithful. And that He's got weighty moments for us that will change our lives. And so lean in and trust that God will meet you as you watch this and as you experience Him in it. Well, hey everybody, my name is Warren, and I'm one of the leaders here at Urban Life, and I'm a normal person. I'm an average guy that gets to follow an extraordinary God. And what I love about our church community, you may have noticed in our culture, is that we don't create like a separation between pastors and people. We believe that all of us are equal here because of the cross and what Jesus has done for us. And so um, I'm a normal guy. We're ordinary people that all get to follow an extraordinary God. And we're so grateful for the story that he's writing here in urban life. And I love looking around and seeing a full room. It's incredible. Can we give God glory for what he's doing? It's amazing. We thank God for that. And um, I want to encourage you to 
um, make an effort to come and join us for the 8.30 meeting too. I love that we've got preteen services there and you can come and maybe get involved there and then get serving in the second, but there's great opportunities for us to do that. And we also have a PM service from 6 p.m. And so you're welcome to come and join us in those moments. How many of you know a company, a company named Apple? How many of you don't know Apple? <laughs> yeah. Apple products. So um, Apple computers and iPhones and iPads and all of those things. Did you know that Apple started in 1980? Hectic. How many of you were alive from 1980? Yeah, you're around. Okay. Let me talk to you folks for a second, you 1980 peeps. Did you know, um, and I'll, let me say this, Apple is doing very well now. Like as a company, I think they're good. They are earning a lot of money. They've got lots of revenue going on. But did you know that in 1980, you could buy a share in Apple products? Did you know that? Yeah. And uh, one share would have cost you $22 in 1980. I'll explain in a moment how much that is in rent. Thanks for asking. And so um, did you know that if you invested in Apple in 1980 by buying one share, or let's say you put $100 in, that's 1,900 Rand for us, okay? Let's imagine you invested 1,900 Rand in stock in Apple. Over time, what happened is their stocks began to split and your one stock is now worth seven or even 11 stocks. It's crazy. But also the value today, if you had put 1,900 Rand into Apple in 1980, you would have 254 shares of Apple and you would have 1.3 million Rands in value. Hey, if you put 1,900 Rand in, you were gonna get 1.3 million out at this point. So my question is, what were you doing in 1980? <laughs> hey, not paying attention. <laughs> People tell me this kind of thing all the time and I'm like, what was I doing? It's the same with housing. I'm like, you know, houses back in the day were 100,000 Rand. My grandfather told me his house was 8,000 Rand when he bought it. And I'm like, what was I doing 20 years ago? Why was I in grade four? And why wasn't I earning money and buying shares in Apple? Come on, you should have been doing that. And I realized actually with investing, it's all about getting in early and over time things begin to grow, right? That's how it works. And did you know that it's the same in the kingdom of God is that generosity is investment. I used to think that when I give, I'm losing. But what I've realized is that when I give, I'm putting seed into the ground and it will grow over time. There will be a return. God actually promises that we get 30, 60, or 100 fold in return. And so we've been looking at our building and, and what God has done for us in this community, um, on this property, and we've been deciding, hey, what could we do to steward things better? How can we get better with what God has given us? And we really feel that now is the time to invest in a solar project for us. And the reason we're doing that is it's going to protect us uh, from surges. It's going to keep our power constant, all the things that we know. But also, in the next 10 years, we will save at least 6 million rand um, in energy bills. That's ESCOM and diesel. Isn't that wild? Yeah. And so this project's going to cost us a million rand. In 10 years, we would have already saved 6 million. To me, I go, that's a no-brainer. Yeah. And so we were talking about it as elders, and we were going like, okay, well, how do we you know, do this? Do we just get a loan? Do we just do, how do we finance this thing? And what we realize is that God is very generous. Yeah. Did you know that? God is very generous, and God can easily put a million rand in our bank account, like that. But as we were talking about it, I was going, give me an opportunity, because I want to invest. I want to put some seed in the ground. I don't want Lauren and I to miss out on an opportunity to put seed in the ground that's going to lead to a harvest later. And so we said, hey, let's give an opportunity to the church. This is not about us raising money. This is an opportunity for you to put some seed in the ground in good soil that we've prepared here. And you can trust and guarantee that God is going to see what you put in the ground and God will bring about a return on your investment. That's how generosity works. And so I want to encourage you, um, as you walk out on the right-hand side and on a couple of our chairs, you've got solar investment uh, brochures over here and you can check that out for more information. You can also choose to give once off or pledge over a few months. Lauren and I are pledging over a few months because that way we can give more. We're trying to get as much seed in the ground as we can get because we want to see a return on investment as we sow into that. And so I'd love for you to go and pray and ask God what to invest into this soil at this stage. Your giving is not manipulation. God loves you, okay? If you don't give, he loves you. He's for you. You are still going to heaven. It's not about money, okay? But man, don't miss an opportunity. I don't want to sit five, 10 years from now and say, man, I should have put some seed in the ground. I want to go, thank you, Jesus, that there's a return on this harvest. And so I'd encourage you to do that. Amen? Amen. I'd love to pray for us and then we'll, we'll get started. So God, I pray that as we've been given this opportunity with good soil, 
It says in, in Corinthians 9 that we can ask you to give us seed to put into the soil. And Father, I pray right now that as you're speaking to us about putting seeds in the soil, as you're speaking to us about being generous, I pray, God, that you would provide seed for sowing. I pray right now that business deals would come through, that clients would pay. I pray that people that owe debts would all of a sudden bring that money back and that we would sit in a place where we go, now I have seed, and that we wouldn't eat it, but that we would put it in yeah. the ground and that we would see a great harvest to come, 30, 60, and 100 fold, because that's how your yeah. kingdom works. We thank you for that, God. Amen. 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 Awesome. Uh, last thing I'll say about that is the, you'll see stickers that are on the solar panel on your right-hand side as you walk out. Every sticker, rep sticker represents 7,000 rand that's come in. And when that solar panel is filled with stickers, our project is done. And so it's a great reminder, and we can celebrate that God has been faithful. We've got 50 grand in so far in pledges and in once-off giving. And so, come on, let's, let's celebrate that. It's brilliant. And it's just the beginning, we feel, of what God wants to do there. So we're in a series called Weightier Matters. It's the 80-20 principle. We kicked it off last week, and we're discovering and asking the question, could there be some practices or some matters that we can attend to that are like the 20%, but could lead to like an 80% yield or an 80% result? What are some of the, the matters in our lives that when we practice them or do them, they can actually bring about br a great breakthrough or great results? Yeah. And so we've been in investigating that a little bit, and <laughs> I've actually been thinking about this. Did you know that the atmosphere that you create is very important? Atmospheres are really important. I love to YouTube stuff, and I saw a video once that made me laugh so hard. It's showing like movie footage where they've replaced the original music with something else. Have you guys ever seen that? And all of a sudden, the whole feel of the movie changes. You'll get like a horror movie, and someone's walking with a knife, and it's going, bing, 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 bing. And you're like, <laughs> but then they take the music away, and then they put in something else, and you're like, why is this person just awkwardly walking around? It's not scary anymore. The atmosphere changed. And so I've been thinking about that, and, and to show off exactly how important atmosphere is and the music behind something, I'm going to read you a short story. And every time I read this story, our incredible sound guys up there are going to change the mood with the music. And we're going to see that the meaning feels very different, even though the words are the same. You ready? Yeah. Okay, let's hear our first music. <laughs> Deep in the woods, a man hiked completely alone, far, far away from anyone. Surrounded by the whispering trees, he finally reached the top of the hill. But wait, someone was already there. He found what he was looking for. You're like, okay, that's a bit weird. Cool story. All right, let's try another one. You can pump it, guys. Deep in the woods, a man hiked completely alone. Far, far away from anyone. Surrounded by whispering trees, he finally reached the top of the hill. But wait, someone was already there. He found what he was looking for. <laughs> okay, let's see the next one. That was a bit too scary. Let's, you guys are like, Whew. deep in the woods. A man hiked completely alone, far, far away from anyone, surrounded by whispering trees. He finally reached the top of the hill, but wait, someone was already there. He found what he was looking for. You guys are all like, I feel good now. I'm glad he found that person. But the previous song, you're like, why did he find the person? He's going to die. <laughs> Run away. Isn't it amazing how music can set an atmosphere and how the same words can have different meaning depending on the atmosphere? You know, if that's true for a movie, how much more true is it for what God says in his word? That as we create an atmosphere and as we understand who God really is, we'll begin to interpret what he says the way that he originally intended to say it. And so we are going to be exploring how we can create atmospheres for weighty moments in our lives. Say weighty moment. 
weighty moments in our lives. And so we're going to pick up this story in Matthew 23, verse 23. And what's happening here is Jesus is standing in front of these people called the Pharisees and the scribes. Now, if you're new to the Bible, the Pharisees and the scribes are like the religious leaders of the day. And they're the kind of people that are trying to hold everybody to the letter of the law. They're going like, you must do this, you must do that, you must do this. And to try and explain more of the law, they were adding laws to the law. And they were trying to get everything right on the outside to try and get um, to please God. And unfortunately, they were so obsessed with the text that they missed the atmosphere of the very Savior of the world standing in front of them. The God that they were trying to please with their good actions was standing in front of them, and they began to not see who Jesus was because they completely misunderstood. And so they're standing in front of Jesus, and Jesus looks at them, and and he says this to them in Matthew 23, verse 23. He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You're doing one thing, and you're saying another, right? He says, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin, but you have neglected the weightier matters. Say weightier matters. You've neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. Now, when I first read that, I'm, I'm kind of a, a swing this way or that way person. I'm very much like, if it must be this, then it can't be that. And what I've realized here is there are weightier matters, but that doesn't mean that we drop everything. And so he goes on to say, these you ought to have done without neglecting the others. But what Jesus is trying to bring across is he's saying, hey, there are weightier matters in life. There are these practices or these things that we can do that begin to bring great results. They bring a great yield to us. And one of the very important things is atmosphere. It's a weighty moment with God that can change everything. You see, these guys, they had a lot of intellect. They, They could argue with you and reason and say like, oh, this is definitely what you should do. But nothing had changed in their hearts. They'd missed moments with the Savior. Did you know moments with God, weighty moments, will change everything for us? And so as I've been reflecting on this, you know, I I like to, when we were talking about the Weighty Matters um, series, we immediately wanted to jump towards like the 10 steps. It's like, well, in your marriage, just do these 10 things. And in your finances, just do these 10 things and you'll be okay. And I like that. I like lists and I like formulas. Are there any person, or people here that like formulas? No, no. Now you know you like formulas. So when I say formula, I don't mean like you're good at math. What I mean is you like to know that when you do this and then that and then this, you will definitely get this result. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. How many of you like formulas now? Yeah, a lot of people do. I'm like that. I'm like, just tell me what I need to do and then I'll do it and then I'll get the result. And what I've learned over time is that God doesn't work that way. I wish he did. It would be so easy, wouldn't it? But there's this gray, there's this in-between that comes with relationship that is not a formula. We can't manufacture it. We can't just plug in X, Y, and Z and expect a result. And I would even speak to people and hear what God is doing in their lives and be like, oh, okay, so, all right, this happened, then you got this text, then you went to that place. And then I would go, it must happen exactly the same in my life because that's how God works. And what I've learned over time is God doesn't work like this, God works like this. And he flows and moves and he's unexpected, but he's always looking to meet with his people and give us weighty moments that will change our lives. And so as we want to jump to what to do, we've really felt pressed to pause and say, wait, before we get to what to do, let's step back and trust for weighty moments with God, because that is what's going to change our lives. We see that's true in Ephesians. In Ephesians 1 verse 17 to 18, and Paul is writing a letter to encourage people. And here's what he says. He says, but I do more than thank. I ask, ask the God of our master, Jesus Christ, the God of glory, to make you intelligent and discerning in knowing him personally. Your eyes focused and clear so that, say so that, so that that you can see exactly what it is he's calling you to do. Grasp the immensity of this glorious way of life that he has for his followers. I first read that and went, Paul, you got this backwards, my dude. We first talk about what to do. And if I get to know God in the process, that's cool with me. But what Paul is saying is we've missed it. It's not about the to-do list. It's not about the formula. It's first about getting to know him. And this word know was originally written in Greek. It's the word gnosko. Can you say gnosko? And if you've ever done starting point, we share this every single time. This word gnosko doesn't mean to know facts. Man, I've known a lot of facts about God my whole life. 
Oh yeah, God's a father. Yeah, God provides. Yeah, God loved. Yeah, Jesus died for my sin. Yeah, that's cool. I, I knew the facts, but I had never experienced the love of my father. I never experienced the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. I never experienced the freedom that comes from his Holy Spirit living in me. And when I did, friends, those weighty moments, things changed. And Paul is saying, come back to the weighty moments. Know him, not through intellect, but through experience with him in the right atmosphere. That will change you forever. That's the weighty things in life, friends, is getting to know him better. We believe that weighty moments in God's presence can change everything. This is true for a guy named Zacchaeus. We're going to pick up his story in Luke 19, verse 1 to 10. And Zacchaeus is a dude, he's a tax collector. In fact, he's the chief tax collector. And so he's like the top dog in this field. Tax collectors in this day, they were Jewish people that had turned on their own kind. Rome had invaded Israel and the Romans had enforced tax to be paid to Rome from the Israelites. And they said, instead of us collecting the tax, we'll just get some Jewish people among the Jewish people to go and collect the tax for us. But we'll sweeten the deal because they're turning on their own people. And so if we want 100 from these people and he decides to charge 500, that's cool with us. He can pocket the difference. And so what was happening is you had these Roman soldiers enforcing guys like Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus could look at you and say, ah, tax today is 600. Give it to me. And people would beg and plead and, and he would oppress the poor and he would extort from them and he would line his own pockets and Rome was backing him in doing it. This was a bad dude. But this guy started to create an atmosphere for a weighty moment. We're gonna pick up what happens here in Luke 19. Zacchaeus hears about Jesus and his desire begins to grow to know who Jesus really is. It says, he entered Jericho and was passing through. This is Jesus. There was a man named Zacchaeus who was the chief tax collector and he was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was. Let's not miss that, friends. He was trying to see who Jesus was. It doesn't matter what your life looks like or where you're at or how broken things may be. When you have a desire to see who Jesus really is, friends, he honors it. He honors it. And so that creates an atmosphere. It says, but he was not able to because of the crowd since he was a short man. And so running ahead, he climbed up a sycamore tree to see Jesus since he was about to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus. You see that in the crowd, Jesus saw Zacchaeus. Friend, in the crowd, Jesus sees you. He sees you. He knows you by name. He's got plans for you. He wants to come alongside you. And it's in these weighty moments that everything changes. He says, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down because today I'm gonna stay at your house. And so he quickly came down and welcomed him joyfully. I think as we welcome the presence of God joyfully, we create an atmosphere. So he welcomes him in joyfully. And, and what I would think is like, if I'm Zacchaeus and Jesus is coming to my house and I'm starting to put two and two together and being like, if this really is God and the savior of the world, the first thing I'm gonna do is start giving excuses. Just me? Jesus walks in, I go, hey, I'm not really a bad person. Can I just tell you, I know that old lady the other day, she said that thing, but actually that's not really what happened. And I just want to tell you about it. Okay, sit down. Can you just see some? But no, instead he had seen something that others had not seen. He'd seen a savior who doesn't care about that, but that wants to welcome Zacchaeus in to his family. And so he sits down with Jesus and it says that all who saw it began to complain. He's gone to lodge with a sinful man. And between verse seven and verse eight, something happens. And it's not recorded here because all of a sudden Zacchaeus changes. And I think God in his wisdom, he hasn't defined exactly what happened here because we would make it a formula. We would go, okay, this, then this, then this, then that. But what we realize is that relationship with God, these weighty moments don't come with formula, but what they do come with is an atmosphere and then we are changed forever because we really encounter God. And so here he has a real encounter with Jesus and it says there, but Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, look, I'll give half of my possessions to the poor Lord and if I've extorted anything from anyone, I'll pay back four times as much. God, Zacchaeus at this point must have heard these things before. He must have known in his head that this is wrong. I shouldn't be doing this to people. Maybe even felt guilty about it or he knew what the right process is and getting stuff paid back. But 
That's not what he needed to hear from Jesus. What he needed was an encounter. What he needed was a weighty moment with the Savior that changes everything. And then his response was to say, I'm giving it all back. I'm forever changed because I've met with Jesus. I've had a weighty moment with God. Jesus says, today salvation has come to this house. Jesus told him, because he too is the son of Abraham, for the son of man has come to seek and save the lost. Friends, weighty moments with the right atmosphere and God can change everything in our lives. Everything. And I've seen this true in my life. I remember a moment where I walked into this exact hall and I had a weighty moment with God where all I knew about was my sin. And for the first time, knowing that God is my savior went from my head to my heart. I experienced his love, his forgiveness, his grace, his mercy, his kindness. Friends, it changed me forever. That same night that I put my faith in Jesus, I actually got baptized. And I remember walking up with, uh, who became a good friend later, Adrian, and he got into this pool with me and I'm standing around and I'm looking at all these people that I don't know in this brand new church. And I went underneath the water and when I came up, the church went wild. Everyone was like, woo! And I was looking around and I'm like, who are these people? What is going on here? Why are they so welcoming? Why do I feel so free? Why do I feel more alive than I've ever felt in my life? I had a weighty moment. It's changed me, friends. The reason that I stand here today is not because I've got my boxes in order or things have lined up. It's because I've experienced Jesus. And I wanna tell you about that. He's good, he's kind, he's loving, and he wants to have weighty moments with you too. I remember a little while later, Chris and I, and we've been friends for a while, and we're like new in our journey with Jesus. We're a couple years in, in our early 20s, and Chris is like, hey, what if we pray together at our friend's house? I'm like, we can do that? Okay, cool. It's like not just on a church building, right? So we head to our friend's house, and we're standing, and we're praying on his like stoop or his patio, and we're praying, and it's cool, and we you know, getting into it. And all of a sudden, friends, we felt the spirit, the presence of God come upon us. We began laughing and crying and going on our knees and just worshiping God. And I learned that day through experience that you can meet with God anywhere, that he can encounter you and bring you joy anywhere. See, it's not just something that I know. I know that because I've experienced weighty moments with him. I remember reading my Bible one day and sitting in my lounge on like a Thursday night, nothing special. And I had some worship on and I was reading through a chapter a day of the Bible at the time. And so I'm reading through the New Testament and I, I, I come across a line that says, you have been approved of by God. And God stops me right there and his presence comes. And I realized my whole life, I've been trying to prove myself to people. I've been trying to show that I'm good enough. I'm good enough. I'm good enough. Never feeling like I really am. And God stopped me right there in a weighty moment. And he said, my boy, I approve of you. I know your failures. I know your weakness. I know your sin. And I still look at you and said, I approve of you. I love you. I'm for you. Friends, it was a weighty moment and it's changed me forever. They happen together. They happen alone. They happen with few. They happen with many. There's no formula to this. (laughs) But friends, weighty moments change everything. Oswald Chambers says it this way. He says, spiritual truth is learned through the atmosphere that surrounds us, not through intellectual reasoning. It is God's spirit that changes the atmosphere of our way of looking at things. And then things begin to be possible, which before were impossible. It's the right atmosphere that causes these weighty moments. And I've been asking questions like, God, how do I create the right atmosphere? How am I going to play the right music in my life that's going to create moments for you to just come and do whatever you want to do? And I've been looking at this and going like, well, what do these guys have? Open hearts. They had a genuine desire to see Jesus for who he really is. You know that you can be a follower of Jesus for 50 years and still have a lot to know about who he is. A lot to learn. We never arrive. You can't tell me anything about Jesus. Man, we're always on a journey saying, Jesus, we want to see you. Father, we want to know you. Would you come and reveal yourself to us? The right atmosphere is community. I love that as we break bread and as we worship together, man, that creates an atmosphere for God to come and move and do what he wants to do. There's weighty moments that happen as we humble ourselves and as we say, God, you come and move and you come do what you want. We desire these weighty moments with you. They can happen. 
I'll never forget one of the weightiest moments of my life. My grandfather is an Italian man. He was a builder. He, was, he had like a green thumb of note. He always had like stuff growing in his garden. He was a carpenter. I have so many memories of going to visit him and standing in his workshop with him and cutting wood, talking about life and, and just enjoying time together. Love my grandfather. He'd been sick for a very long time. And in 2018, he went to hospital and he was lying in ICU. And I remember Lauren and I going to visit him. I remember the pain that I felt when I walked in and I saw a man that I love, frail, lying on a hospital bed with tubes in his mouth and dialysis and just couldn't move, couldn't do anything for himself. I stood next to his bedside and I tried to laugh. He's always been a joyful guy. <laughs> and friends, I was hurting seeing him like that. It was really difficult for him to talk because of the tube in his mouth. And so as we stood around his bed, he would try and talk to us with sign language and trying to use his words, but all of us were struggling to understand him. And for some reason, I was the one that could understand him the best. I didn't understand everything, but for some reason, I could just sort of understand what he was saying. And, and he began to want me next to his bed to try and interpret what was going on. And so we went to visit him a couple of times. And one of the times I'm sitting next to his bed and he pulls out this piece of paper that he asked for and he wants a pen. And he starts to write down money numbers on this paper. My grandfather was a wealthy man. He writes down all of these numbers and he's starting to circle things and give percentages towards it. And I'm going, oops, what are you doing? What is this? And he says to me, this is how I want my money to go. And I'm like, okay, so is this your will? Is this what you want in your will? He's like, yes. So I asked him, well, doesn't your will say this already? And he's like, no, it doesn't. <laughs> so I said to him, well, why, why do you want to tell me this now? Why do you want to change it now? And then he said to me something that I wasn't expecting. He said, I'm worried that your grandmother is going to take all the money and that she will write you and your mom and your brother off. Now, that might sound shocking to you, but my grandmother married my grandfather when my mom was one. And she never really integrated the family. She'd always had a bit of a hurt and pain towards us. And my grandfather was worried that she would take it all and that she would cut us off. And so we got a lawyer in, and he came into the hospital, and he brought his sheet, and he's like, look, guys, for this to stand as a legal document, your grandfather has to write his full name, his address, and his ID number legibly for this to stand in court. And so they gave him the pen, and my grandfather took this pen, and he was so weak that he couldn't write. And he tried, and he tried, and I saw the frustration in him and the desperation to get it right, but he just couldn't. And eventually, he just asked us to leave, and he said, come back another day. And then he passed away. I had the privilege of doing his funeral. And as I stood before my family, I, I declared the goodness of Jesus and the gospel. And knowing what my grandfather had said, his worries, I, I told our family, hey, let's stick together in this. Let's walk forward together in this. And that was the last day I saw my grandmother for six years. And I want to clarify, I love her. I wish the best for her. God has done a deep work in my heart. But I want to honor God in this story. So I remember visiting my mom a little while later and I'm sitting in the garden with her and I see a Sprite can in the garden. I'm like, mom, what is that? And she shows it to me and the Sprite can's got a little sprout sticking out of it with soil. And she said, your opa planted this from a seed. He had a green thumb and he planted this little lemon tree in the Sprite can. She said, my boy, do you want it? I said, I, I really do, mom. And I took it home and I said to Lauren, this is the only thing I have from my grandfather. It's the only, this is my inheritance. This is it. And I took it home and I, I looked after it and I, I don't, I'm not a green thumb at all, but man, I tried. <laughs> and I eventually transplanted it to another part as it grew and I really looked after it the best I could. And it wasn't just a lemon tree. It was something so much more to me. And one day Lauren and I decided to go on holiday and to get someone to come look after our house. And I tried to explain to them please don't let the lemon tree die. And it's really hard to explain that because to most people, it's just a lemon tree. But to me, it's so much more. 
And so we went on holiday to the beach and we had a great time and we came back. And when I walked outside, I will never forget the moment that I laid my eyes on that tree and saw it was dead. And I wept for a lemon tree. And I just cried out to God. I said, God, don't you see me? Don't you know me? What are you going to do to restore? Are you not faithful? And so I went through the process of healing, and we never told anyone about the lemon tree. We just left it. And about two years later, the guys approached us and said, hey, we really feel that God is calling you into eldership. And so Lauren and I prayed it through, and we felt, yes, God is calling us into this. And so we had a moment at the beginning of 2020 on this stage where we were prayed into this role of being elders. And part of that moment is we were given gifts. It was great. It's people gave me like New Balance shoes and they were like, you're going to bring New Balance to people. And I'm like, come on, this is great. <laughs> Significant gifts. They gave us like spatulas and they're like, you're going to host lots of people in your home and bring wholeness there. I'm like, come on. They gave Lauren perfume and then they're like, you know, the, the fragrance of God is going to fill your house and your home. And I'm like, come on, it's beautiful. It's beautiful, right? These significant things. And then I turned around as Gareth pulled a gift bag onto stage. And this is what happened. And I asked God, what, what should we get for you guys? Just something small and simple. And it was almost immediate. I felt like I had an answer from him. And it's not a his and hers in this, but um, in this lemon tree here, and it's not because, you know, people say when life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. It's not that. A lemon tree is, is one of the fruit trees that bears fruit in every season. It never stops bearing fruit. And, and one little lemon tree can bear over 100 kgs of fruit in a year. And I prophesy over you that you will be a couple that bears fruit in every season, in the natural and in the supernatural. You will always, always bear fruit. And you can you can plant that in your in your temporary home, and one day when you have a forever home, you can move it and you can plant it there, and it'll keep bearing fruit. You put it in the right conditions, in the right soil, sunlight, water, the fruit will be there. Friends, I had a waiting moment with God. He sees you. He knows you. And God has reminded me every time I look at that lemon tree, and I did it this morning, I rubbed the leaves, and as I was feeling it, I was like, God, you are so faithful. You're so kind. And God has taught me, not just in my head, but he's shown me through experience that he will look after our family, that he loves us, he sees us, he's for us. Friends, I know it. I know it. And it's changed the way that I live. I saw my grandmother this year for the first time in six years. I ran into her at a shopping mall. And when I saw her looking at clothes, I, I didn't even recognize her at first. And I looked over to Laura and I'm like, I think that's her. And immediately the pain came back and I thought, let me just run away. Let me just pretend like I'm not seeing her and that this will be done. And I felt God say, my boy, you've experienced life change, go to her. And I walked up to her and I said, so good to see you. And I embraced her and she stood shocked. Not having seen us for six years, not knowing my kids. I said, I love you. It's good to see you. You look well. And I walked away from that moment and prayed for blessing for her. Prayed that she'd come to know Jesus because friends, inheritance doesn't come from people, it comes from him. And as we do that, we realize it's, it's changed everything. Friends, it's the weighty moments with God that change us forever. It's the right atmosphere that God comes and does what He wants to do in a way that only He can, that brings about change forever. God can do more in a moment than what you can do in a lifetime. Let's stand. Let's close our eyes. <clears throat> I really believe that as we've been setting an atmosphere here that God is gonna give us weighty moments with Him.
Jesus, we want to see you. Our hearts are open to you. Would you come and do what you want to do because we want to know you, God. Let's just create some room and allow him to do what he wants. Saul and he is charging down the wrong path. He's trying to persecute the church. He is so against Jesus. And while he's running down that path, he gets knocked off his horse and he has a weighty moment with the Savior. He sees Jesus for who he really is. And everything changed in his life. He went from a man that was once persecuting the church to a man that planted churches, to a man that wrote courage to churches, to a man that wanted to see the church flourish. And today, most of our New Testament was written by this man who had weighty moments with God. Weighty moments. Friends, what could God do in your life through a weighty moment? Maybe you've been charging down the wrong path. Maybe like Zacchaeus, you're ashamed of what you've done. Friend, I wanna tell you that God doesn't look at you and keep you away from you, from Him because of your sin, but that our God is a God that wants to come into your life, that wants to heal you and make you whole through weighty moments with Him, to experience His love, experience His forgiveness, experience His mercy, experience His grace, experience Him as a Father, welcome you into a family as He calls you into purpose. And friend, all we need to do is make a decision to put our faith in Him and we can have all of that. It's a weighty moment. We are back. How was your first time? How was church? Church was beautiful. My first time was interesting. Interesting, yeah, yes, tell us I more. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the word. I enjoyed the worship. And the atmosphere, the freedom to just be you and fellowship with God. I loved it. Yeah, I've been searching for spiritual homes. I guess this is going to be my home. Come on, high five. That's amazing. Yeah. Welcome. We're so glad to have you. And I'm so glad we managed to catch you. See and me more. We're going to see you more now. Now we know you. Yeah. Uh, let's go grab your son and see how he found it. Yeah, all right. <laughs> And that is a wrap on this beautiful Sunday. Thank you so much for joining us. We will see you next week. Make sure to get connected. And if you need to know anything, head over to our Church Center app. This next video is gonna show you exactly where to find it, how to get connected, how to take your next steps, because we wanna journey with you as you take your next steps. So I'll see you next week. Have a beautiful week and keep warm today. We want to create a simple path to belonging in urban life. Introducing the Church Center app, your gateway to a richer church experience. Here you can engage with us, share the incredible miracles God has worked in your life and seek support through prayer. Don't miss out on our diverse range of events from free short courses to meaningful milestones like water baptism and child dedication. We thrive when we do life together. Join one of our vibrant small groups, build friendships and dinner parties, connect with fellow parents in our parents' groups, or find strength in our addiction recovery community. 
Stay in the loop with our Sunday messages and weekly blogs as we collectively turn our hearts towards Sunday. Keep your notifications on, ensuring you never miss an update. Embrace the fullness of church life. Download our Church Center app today. It's available on both the App Store and Google Play.